Hello and welcome to News Center. I'm Parikshit Lutra. India, the world's largest rice exporter, has banned exports of broken rice and imposed a 20% tax on exports of various grades of rice. All this in order to bring down prices in the local market. Parboiled and basmati rice have been excluded from the 20% levy. Meanwhile, we reported yesterday that over a million tons of rice export shipments stuck at various ports across India with buyers refusing to pay the 20% levy over and above the pre-fixed price. Vinod Kaul, Senior Executive Director of All India Rice Exporters Association is now joining us. Uh, Mr. Kaul, what is the current situation at ports across the country? How much rice of different categories would be stuck? See, an estimate is that around 10 lakh tons is stuck at the ports. Many uh, go to return because uh, uh, there are only three conditions that government has put under the ban notification for transitional arrangement. And uh, they have said that consignments for the shipping wheels were made and the consignments were handed over to the customs or they had already been allocated vessel location number only such consignments will be allowed to go through. No other consignment is presently being permitted, and that is uh, causing a huge uh, uh, difficulty for the trade at the moment. Right. Uh, Mr. Call, are the rice consignments, which had been allowed under the three exempted categories, are they being allowed? Yes, they are being allowed. Although there are some difficulties still being faced by exporters, but as per notification, that is why CBIC has yesterday issued a clarificatory note to customs commissioners asking them to disseminate this information of transitional arrangement to all their uh, concerned functionaries so that uh, proper adherence is done and right. there are no confusions for the trade. Uh, what is uh, the relief that you are seeking right now? Are you in talks with the Finance Ministry, the Commerce Ministry, the DGFT? Yes, we are in touch with all three. We have been representing our uh, thoughts. And, uh, uh, you know, but uh, so far there is no uh, outcome. We have presented our cases, like organic uh, uh, products should be allowed and uh, the consignments for which orders were received advances were received to whatever extent, we are requesting that these may be considered for uh, uh, being shipped out. Okay. But so far, you know, the, we are just in uh, talks with the government. We have written to Ministry of Finance. We uh, have written to DGFT and uh, Ministry of Commerce and APIDA, everyone. Okay. Uh, could you once again give us a sense of the relaxation, the relief that you're seeking? See, relaxation in the sense we are seeing this is... You see, government takes a initial decision in its best term uh, because they may have also considered all uh, pros and cons. We are requesting government that wherever orders were received and they were under execution, uh, uh, kindly consider that these may be allowed. Right. Uh, and what about paying 20% export duty on non-Basmati rice? What percentage of uh, exporters, according to you, are uh, willing to pay this duty right now? See, that's a million dollar question at the moment because um, the, uh, contracts were entered earlier at a uh, price that was negotiated between the two parties. And uh, what is understood that presently importers are not willing to bear the additional cost burden. So all the cost, if it is to be borne by the exporters, I don't think he, uh, they will be able to uh, make shipments to the exporters. There will be huge damages uh, to them. Hmm. Right. Uh, so you are... Uh, because you see, one reason why I say so, because uh, one has to look into the fact that the margins that today rice exporters earn are not more than 2 to 3%. Hmm. And uh, the additional burden of 20% is massive. Hmm. Right. So uh, give us a sense of the kind of damage that may take place uh, as a result of this. What will be the setback to uh, exporters because of this 20% duty? That is going to be a huge uh, loss. You, you know, if I first talk about, uh, I just made a calculation about uh, uh, broken rice since it has been banned. So I think uh, if we take last year's figure, if it was to be achieved this financial year also, and what has been exported till now, the balance uh, would be left around uh, 2 to 2.5 million tons. 
and going by the average cost of around three fifty dollars to a ton, the loss is around six thousand uh, crores. Hmm. That is only for uh, broken rice and. Uh, uh, other things I have not yet calculated, but uh, I'll have to make calculations based on what impact the 20% duty will do and um, uh, how cost ineffective our material will become vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Mm -hmm. So that will take a, a little time. Right. So, but the damage is going to be huge. All right. So both for broken rice and also for uh, non-basmati rice, uh, you are asking the government that wherever the orders were under process, uh, you should allow them. You should allow them to be exported under the prevailing uh, tariff uh, system and not uh, under the new 20% uh, duty? Yes, yes. Right. Uh, any uh, hint of concession or relief coming from the government? Uh, honestly, we don't foresee any relief uh, coming uh, very soon at the moment. Right. Uh, but do you expect the ports to be cleared up? Yeah. And w which are these ports where the maximum amount of rice consignments are stuck, uh, Mr. Call? Kakinada. Because Kakinada was a major center of non basmati rice shipments. All right. Uh, so that were uh, the right ex Rice Exporters Association speaking to CNBC TV 18, saying that uh, they are suffering huge losses as a result of these latest duties on non-basmati rice and ban on export of broken rice. Hoping for some concession, but uh, not very optimistic at the same time. We're going to take a break, but coming up, an exclusive interaction with Bernard Charles, the CEO and Vice Chairman at Dassault Systems, about the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war on the company and their India business. Much more coming up on the other side. Welcome back. French major Dassault Systems is upbeat on India's digitization drive. Dassault has announced that electrical goods maker Havels is using its expertise to digitize factories in India. Dassault believes it is well positioned to drive growth through mobility technology. I spoke to Bernard Charles, the CEO and uh, vice chairman of Dassault Systems on the company's growth blueprint, global uncertainties and their China plus one strategy. India is, is a significant part of the what we call a, AP revenue. Of course, China is still is, is also very dynamic, uh, despite the fact that in the last two years it was a very special situation in China, even to just access uh, on, on work with, uh, with uh, Chinese companies. But Japan is very strong. Uh, on Korea was weak, but coming back. However, on the potential, on the growth dynamic, things are happening here and, and especially with the the intent to have to establish this kind of new high quality um, manufacturing network uh, for all type of industries and not only mobility uh, or uh, med tech or high tech or energy systems we have great customers like Larson, Tubro, Mindra, Mindra, Tata Motors and all these great companies but also a lot of startup so the potential is really here and, and look at the population dynamic, the elevation of the education uh, on, on, on relief the future. The future in India is, is, is really where we should continue to build our, uh, our partnership. We have the biggest R&D platform in Asia is here in India by far because we feel we are well protected from an IP standpoint. Uh, we trust the quality of people, quality of edu uh, education. And to give you an example, I did an acquisition of a big platform that made all the, almost all the COVID clinical trial called Medidata. Mm. And in less than two years, we s started from zero in the, in the med tech mm. to almost a thousand people now working here for that that brand at the system. So you can see the speed even during pandemic time. Currently some of the challenges for the automotive sector, for example, uh, one of the companies, one of the sectors that you assist in India, there have been challenges with regard to supply chain, uh, supply chain resilience, and also scaling up uh, production. So how are you helping automotive companies 
or companies in other manufacturing sectors scale up production? What are the solutions that you're offering them? Well, uh, everyone has been suffering from uh, supply. Uh, everyone around, uh, even the most uh, premium companies, even even sometimes more even. Uh, so that's a, that's a global problem, which I think is going to have a consequence of looking at more uh, new supply and new sovereignty aspect. That's a specific question by itself. Now, how, what are we doing? I would say that today, manufacturing infrastructure of the best players in, in uh, India has nothing to envy to the best uh, abroad in America or Europe. I, I know that and I, I see also them like uh, our friends at uh, uh, GBM, uh, they are having plants in Europe, they are getting contracts in Europe, which means that they master quality, performance, and they can get the contract because they have a better value related to the cost. So I think it's more, the challenge is more now reorientation towards sustainability and scaling up a more consistent supply network. Mm. But um, unlike five or 10 years ago, uh, best of breed can be done here. Question on the global uncertainties. If I were to ask you one permanent impact on your business or businesses in Europe that you see as a result of the Ukraine-Russia war? Well, of course, the energy question is, uh, is, a, is a big question. Uh, how how much will be the impact for our clients in manufacturing industry at large. At the same time, um, without being too provocative, uh, it's accelerating our business. Why? Because uh, frugality is now on the agenda. On new ways to do things with less resources is on the agenda, as well as the sustainability life cycle of things. And, and this is creating a accelerated innovation on material science, bioscience. If you look at the industry of the last century, not 10 years, a century, it has been based on very basic material transformation. Uh, substitution to plastic, substitution to maybe certain cat categories of materials which are uh, becoming um, limited in quantity around the world. So this material, material science, new thinking process is at the heart of what we do and it's accelerating our growth. Right. Not to speak about chemistry and bioscience, of course. Right. Uh, the kind of decoupling that we are seeing from Russia uh, at this juncture, do you feel that it, it needs, a, needs some amount of calibration considering the impact it may have on um, European businesses, the European economy, as well? That's a, that's a big, big sub topic for debate. Uh, I think uh, Europe has been taking a very strict position. Uh, you know, uh, we are in a democracy on uh, uh, the social model, uh, on the same here in, uh, in India. Um, we have values. Uh, you cannot compromise too much on those values. This, this is a war um, considered to be an inappropriate unnecessary war uh, we step out from China from uh, um, Russia um, we follow the follow the rules uh, we even offer job to uh, Russian good colleagues uh, outside Russia so we we have been taking care of our people but clearly the sanctions are very clear on in our company, we don't play with those uh, topics. We have so many strategic customers the, around the world. We we follow the sanction. Uh, we don't not used to do poli politics in the in the company, but uh, I think that uh, this new balance is going to create a long-term effect. Uh, but maybe it's also solidifying Europe, mm. and also uh, identifying better what are the key uh, country cooperation where the trust is there to build the future. My final question, uh, China plus one strategy. Uh, how is that important for you at this juncture? Well, that's, uh, that obviously many companies in the world have been creating a lot of dependencies on China. At the same time, China has been developing 
at a fast speed its innovation, not only low cost production. So uh, the China plan, for example, on EV uh, has not much to uh, envy to other uh, well developed uh, premium brand, and they want to export. Mm. So just that aspect will create a new position for India in that context. Mm. Because when the market is a consumer market, when it's only for low cost production, it's one thing. But when it's, when it's coming for premium solution, it creates a new balance. And India has to play a role here. And remember, I think that everyone should keep in mind sustainability is changing all rules, mm. all rules on every sector. Mm. So the current winners might not be the winners of the future because, because sustainability will create new set of constraints on new set of opportunities that uh, will change the market. Look at EV market. Mm. How many startups have been growing so fast? Mm. Tesla is my client. Most of them are my clients. They have redefined the game. We talk here about mobility as a service in, in India. I think it will happen, and probably will happen faster in India than anywhere else. Uh, why to buy a car? Can I buy a service? Same with other type of services. So sustainability probably will prevail over the current political constraints. All right, so that was uh, Bernard Charles, uh, the CEO of Dassault Systems, saying that uh, he sees the greatest growth potential in India and 25% of their R&D spends are directed towards the India market. Shifting focus to the used car segment now, Amit Kumar, the CEO of OLX Group India, is gung-ho about the sector. In a conversation with me, Kumar says that the used car market is already outpacing the new car segment in 2022. Here's a slice of that conversation. The used car market is going through some really exciting times. Uh, the pandemic just proved a catalyst in the long-term growth uh, that, that any, any sort of emerging market, uh, market goes through. Uh, the, the used car market around 2015 was smaller than the new car market. Uh, now we are around 1.3, 1.4x of the market. And by 2026, this is going to be a 7 million cars market. Uh, in terms of this year specifically, the used car market growth continues to outpace the new car market. Uh, it is typically a, a 1.5x, uh, the kind of number that it shows. So uh, if, if you look at the new car market, that typically grows between 8 to 10%. This year, they're showing good numbers. While the new car, while the used car market is, is at a kager of 15% uh, till 2026, taking us to 7 million cars. Right. Uh, I'd also like to ask you, how much are you investing this year into growing your business footprint? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question to uh, ask for a Rosus uh, Naspers invested company. Uh, uh, we, we, are, we are quite uh, aggressive in the way we've uh, built our business. Uh, but unfortunately, I cannot share specific numbers with, with you. But what I can tell you is that uh, the business is growing leaps and bounds. Uh, I think the big shift which which COVID induced uh, is 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 in the user preferences uh, of uh, uh, users wanting us to go to their homes uh, to inspect the cars that they want. As a result, most of our business has has moved from a retail center driven model to a home inspection driven model. As a result, the top of the funnels uh, for the business have become almost uh, three three and a half x, and that's the kind of growth that that we've witnessed in the last twelve months. Right. Uh in terms of popularity among car models, what is the greatest amount of preference that you see uh, among customers? See, uh, if, you, if you look at the last couple of years, uh, uh, the, the unique utility vehicles have, have definitely seen uh, uh, greater preference uh, in the new car market. And the same uh, is, is visible in the used car market also. So you, if you pick the likes of Scorpio uh, and, and Kratas, et cetera, they, they've definitely uh, uh, seen an uptick of close to 150% in the demand uh, that, that these cars have seen. Uh, in addition, I think fuel efficient cars have seen greater traction because uh, of the rise in the fuel prices. CNG cars uh, have seen uh, a lot of shortage uh, uh, because there is an incremental or increased demand uh, uh, because again of uh, the, the, the fuel price rises. In terms of specific models, uh, you, will, you will find uh, 
familiar names which which have significant market share the swifts the swift desires the items of the world they continue to uh, be an important part or a significant chunk of the used car market the the, the very sort of obvious reason is that uh, uh, the, the used car market mirrors uh, the new car market trends uh, that that you see in the last 3 to 4 years plus if you look at the geography split uh, we see uh, uh, north gaining traction uh, because it was slightly less impacted from covid so it came back to feet and start see, started seeing growth uh, faster if you look at the luxury cars uh, uh, specifically what we've seen is uh, uh, the the luxury car markets in in the tier 2 has grown at almost a 45% uh, year on year uh, while while in the tier 1 markets you see that number at a more 40% but the luxury cars have become slightly more expensive uh, year on year uh, uh, across brands uh, bmw audi mercedes etc right uh, finally to uh, to also ask you uh, do you also see a lack of supply when it comes to uh, used cars in the market is that a problem while there is growing demand for used cars is there a lack of supply are people postponing uh, new purchases postponing selling their cars or exchanging their cars for new ones See, there is a definite la lack of new car supply in the market, uh, fueled by uh, uh, supply chain issues, global supply chain issues, uh, the chip shortage. Now, uh, that that leads to uh, medium term issues for the used car markets, uh, which which I am hoping uh, uh, get get sort of moderated because of the macroeconomic shifts that we are seeing in the market. Uh, but but in terms of exchange supplies, also uh, uh, the the OEMs and we have seen some degree of decline. But I think if you, if you look at the overall picture, given that the used car market is going going and growing at such a pace that that factor is not playing out very big. Uh, I think the 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 preference for used cars and the price discovery for used cars. Uh, uh, if you look at the used car prices in in, in the last couple of years, they've they've hardened at least ten to twelve percent. So there is there is that supply balance shift which is which is happening. Uh, there is some shortage of supply, but I wouldn't say that's a that's a sort of significant factor impacting the pre-owned car market. All right, uh, clearly used car uh, segment. We'll see strong growth over the next few months. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of News Center. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.